Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the uh, Open Data for Open Science session. I'll start with a uh, brief introduction to what we're trying to do at Microsoft to support environmental research with uh, and the technology package we put together in called the Environmental Informatics Framework. And, and then um, the, the following presentations will, you will, go, will bring you through several examples that how uh, EIF has been collaborating with uh, environmental science. Um, you seen, if you were at the keynote by Dan Fay uh, the, in the first day, you have seen these slides. Um, it, it captures our learnings from environmental researchers about um, the data challenges in this area. Um, by now, everybody is already familiar with all these terms about data sharing, about uh, data quality control. And on top of that, as from looking at a computing perspective, there is this hidden problems that scientists may not have time or priority to, to address. That is the versioning, provenance, and the curation of data. Um, so Dan kind of like showed this slides as well, the situation, the current the data ecosystem, because of uh, different formats of data comes in huge amount of data sets. Come on in. Oh. <laughs> oh, did I lock it? I'm sorry, didn't mean that. <laughs> Um, so um, we're facing, this is the situation that we feel like it. There's tons of applications out there trying to access data in different ways. And there is, on the server side, there is also different applications trying to store the data in different formats. Um, at some point at Microsoft, this is the situation we're facing with different um, um, products. We have data interoperability issues among ourselves. That's how we come up with this solution called Open Data Protocol. And this is our way of solving the data interoperability issues among our own uh, different domains of products. And so uh, later on, Chris, after the lunch break, he's going to give you a detailed um, introduction into uh, all data as well as demos. And so I'm not going to go into it too much. Just to say that in the early days, when the you know HTTP becomes available, that's how you can um, query a piece of information using a simple URL. And today, that's what you know, all data enables you to do to query a piece of data using a URL. And so, using this simple protocol, we gathered and then aggregated the all the main products and technologies from Microsoft into this environmental research space. And we're hoping that this, collectively this technology in this framework will advance environmental research data discoverability, accessibility, and consumability. So I have some examples which actually is going to be covered by individual presenters today. Um, here, let me just move to one of the projects that I don't think is covered by the following presentations, that's the newest addition to our uh, showcase of EIF. Um, it, the code name is Clio. It really means cutting the long tail in environmental observation. What we're trying to do in this project is to come up with a portable um, toolkit and that enables participatory environmental monitoring. And you, can, you may say that there is tons of this kind of device out there already available, and why another one? The main idea is that we wanted to provide a platform independent design to advance the data interoperability um, issue here. And how we um, achieve that? We uh, use the only piece of interfacing, I guess, uh, on, the, on most of the devices, that 3.5 millimeter jack. That's universal, the water jack. And the, uh, the data output and the input is going to be in all data format, as I previously uh, mentioned, that protocol. 
and the data is going to be directly pushed to the cloud to our Windows Azure. Um, so there's also several advanced the cutting edge technology from Microsoft Research uh, will be applied to this simple toolkit, including the, the power, the power um, technology using the solar cells and the time synchronizer through the low power long range radio. And we also make the best use of the location aware through a low energy GPS solution. And these are, these are all like quite new, all new technologies actually going to be integrated into that tiny little device. And we meant to make it portable. People can carry it on their um, backpack perhaps. Like, so uh, a new scenario we have been exploring is that say that you go visit Yellowstone Park and National Park, usually you will be handed with uh, a map as you pay for the entrance. Perhaps if you volunteer, then they will hand you a toolkit like this, and you put it on your backpack, and then as you visit, you're collecting data naturally, and then as you leave the park, and you can hand the toolkit back, and that way we collect the data from all the participants. Um, so it's right now in the prototyping process, and we hope that uh, early this year we can do a demo with this toolkit and then deploy it later um, in 2012. So um, with that, I'm going to close so that the, the following uh, people can give you specific examples of how EIF work. I just want to say that there is an upcoming event that we're really excited about. Uh, we did it last year, Open Data for Open Science Training Workshop. This is in, um, uh, it's going to happen in Microsoft main campus. Um, it's meant to be a mind swap event. We gather the technologists and engineers from Microsoft together with partic participants who bring their own environmental research data. So we engage the research scenarios with our technologies. And then you can implement your applications right there, get some hands-on experience. So if you're interested, let me know. And then you're very welcome to join us at Microsoft main campus at this event. So. Um, with that, I wanted to move to our next presenter, yes. Brian. While I'm switching gears, um, I'll take questions if there is any. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Krauss. Uh, I've been with the Pivot Viewer team at Microsoft uh, since the project began a couple years ago. Um, and for the last year, I've been the senior developer on the project. Now, it's my intention with this presentation to uh, tell you a little and show you a lot. Uh, so I'll try to speed through my slides and uh, focus mainly on demos. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to say a few words about uh, infographics and why I call Pivot Viewer a living infographic. Um, infographics are everywhere these days. You have a few pictures here, um, four among the many thousands that you might find on the internet. Um, uh, infographics are popular uh, for a reason. They're a great way to uh, distill uh, complex information into a very accessible format. Um, and a well-designed infographic will uh, make major features available um, at a glance and will also reveal uh, details to anyone who's uh, willing to inspect the data further. Now, infographics are nothing new. This is uh, Haeckel's paleontological tree of vertebrates from 1879. Um, there's some major features that uh, uh, jump out at you just looking at this data. There are these large explosions of diversity um, throughout the evolutionary tree, and then the subsequent uh, large extinctions um, that then uh, create space for uh, new creatures to evolve. Um, now, infographics aren't without their problems, however, um, because they're static, because they're graphics, they're fixed in time uh, and in scope. They don't incorporate any new knowledge that's been gathered um, and typically only offer a single view of the data and hence uh, are very vulnerable to the bias of their creator. Um, they might show a view of the data that's, um, that uh, leads you to the same conclusions uh, that they have. So back to our example, um, this was created in 1879. It's great for historical purposes, but there's a lot of new science that this doesn't involve, clearly. Um, second, there's a little bit of uh, human-centered bias here. Uh, mammals are shown 
on the far right side of the tree as uh, the preeminent um, uh, species and the height of evolutionary uh, of evolution. Um, you also notice this age of man uh, title centered uh, within the mammal group, even though man is just one small part of that group. Um, so when I talk about Pivot Viewer as a living infographic, um, I, I'm talking about it, it has the, uh, the strengths of infographics, of um, being accessible um, and visual, but at the same time it's created from live data. Um, the user is also free to direct the visualization and um, look at data from different perspectives and see new relationships in ways that uh, an infographic doesn't allow. Uh, so with Pivot Viewer, uh, the viewer actively explores the data instead of passively consuming a graphic. So with that, I'll go to my first demo. Um, so this is data from the periodic table of elements. Uh, it's a bit of a toy example because it's such a small collection. See, this is a fairly common view of the periodic table. And you'll notice, too, that uh, the items are color-coded based on their category, as with a standard uh, periodic table. This allows uh, information to uh, jump out more readily. Let's look at when these uh, elements were created, or not created, uh, discovered. I could say something about the Age of Enlightenment here, but let's focus on the 1900s. Uh, now this is an interesting graph. Uh, there's a major feature available here, um, a, a spike starting in the 1940s and leading through the 1950s. Now, I don't have a great knowledge of scientific history, but some major world events were occurring in those times. Um, it's a further hint that uh, these elements are radioactive. Uh, if I zoom in on these items, I get a little bit of confirmation, uh, Laurentium and Berkelium uh, indicative of the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory that did a lot of uh, the work on the Manhattan Project. So these were all elements discovered during the Manhattan Project. Now you may have noticed as I zoomed in, these items became more complex uh, and showed additional information. And as I zoom out, uh, they came become simple uh, so that the view isn't cluttered. Uh, you also notice that these, this is a fairly standard display for the periodic table of elements. I've defined these visuals specifically for this collection. Uh, as I have for all the collections I'm going to show today. Uh, now there was one noble gas that was discovered in the 1900s. Uh, as I select it, you see this uh, pane on the right, the detail pane. Uh, it shows all the information you know about that element. I can also click to filter uh, just to the noble gases. And since these are gases, uh, let me look at the boiling point of them. Now, uh, that makes me curious what other elements are gases at uh, normal Earth temperatures. So I can quickly come over to this filter pane um, and apply a filter on the boiling point and see those items. Okay, I'm going to go back to the slides for a minute. Uh, just to review a little bit of what I showed, um, you can sort by any property within the data. Uh, I didn't really call this out, but there's two views, uh, a sorted grid view and a graph view. Uh, and then you can filter by any property in the data, and we have custom uh, filter interfaces for different data types. Uh, finally, uh, we use, uh, heavily use a zooming metaphor. Um, you can zoom in to see more detail on individual items, or you can zoom out to see the overall context uh, that these items are, exist in. Now, a lot of these uh, features, uh, specifically uh, sorting and filtering, are, are common these days. Any modern shopping site will show you, will allow you to uh, sort and filter your data. Um, so let me say a few words about why Pivot Viewer is different and, and what we're doing differently. So the whole idea, vision behind Pivot Viewer is that the whole of a collection of data is greater than the sum of its parts. So there's information available within the collection that isn't available in the items themselves, like uh, the information we saw about the Manhattan Project coming out of the periodic table of elements. Um, Pivot Viewer is highly visual um, and is designed in such a way that, um, that insights pop out at the user 
Um, there's a lot of effort uh, made to make things fluid. Um, items don't just disappear. They move from one place to another, animate in and out uh, in a way that, that really resonates with our visual sense and our expectation of how objects work in the world. Um, and put together with the ability to interact and uh, slice the data in different ways and filter it, uh, you really have the opportunity, opportunity to see new perspectives and new relationships within this data. Um, further, there are two scenarios that Pivot Viewer was designed for. One I like to call a, a faceted browse. Now, this is a little more than a normal browse scenario where you might go from one web, web page to another. Uh, in this case, you might be going from one item to many items, many item to one item, or many items to many items in a much more complex way. Uh, this is sort of what I've shown so far, just following curiosities through the data, following whims uh, in ways that reveal new insights. Uh, the second scenario is more of a search scenario where you're looking for particular items and you're applying a, a number of filters to get down a, to a certain set you're interested in. And I'll demonstrate that in a moment. So for my second demo, um, this is a collection of information from uh, the United States Department of Agriculture's nutrient database. You'll notice that these items are colored based uh, roughly on the food pyramid food pyramid. So um, to, to delve into that uh, faceted search, so I'm a fairly health conscious person uh, living in Seattle. So let me find items that are low in saturated fat. And low in sugar. And now if you know anything about Seattle weather this time of year, uh, you know that we don't get a lot of sunlight. Uh, so let me look for items that are high in vitamin D to make up for that a little bit. So you see in a few clicks, I've narrowed this set down to a few items, uh, a number of mushroom types, uh, and fish, um, which would also be very beneficial to those in here in Stockholm. Uh, now that we're zoomed in more, you can also see that there are these secondary colors on each of the items uh, that are indicative of the number of calories, so that allows you to at a glance, uh, see that information within this chart. Uh, one, another feature of Pivot Viewer is you can customize this detail pane. So in this case, I've made it look like a, a standard American nutrition facts label. Uh, now, uh, cod is, especially this dried and salted cod, is very high in sodium. Let me take a look at sodium a little bit. Now I might add that there's a lot of data here. The, this database is very rich. Uh, I'm just going to call out a few things, but there's actually a lot of information here to be mined. So most items are in this first column here. Let's delve into that a little more. Now you can see a little bit of uh, two spikes here within the vegetables. So if we look at just the vegetables, you have this large set that are low in sodium, and then you have this uh, other set that's fairly high in sodium. If we zoom in on those items, we can actually see that these items are pre-salted. So clearly, they're going to be a lot higher in salt. So if we want to avoid salt intake, we just avoid those salt-added items. If we switch over to protein, um, we'll notice that those salt-added vegetables are actually much higher in salt also than most of the proteins. And if we delve into protein further, we get a little bit of a normal curve here in the data. And then we also have a number of items at the low end of the salt range that are very high in calories. So what are those? Oh, those are nuts and soy products. That makes sense. Let me go back, uh, look at vegetables. Now looking just at vegetables, uh, there's a few items that jump out um, as being high in calories. So if I zoom in, they're uh, peanuts. So another feature within Pivot Viewer is you can override the interface that's shown when an item is selected. 
So in this case, I've created a simple editing interface. I actually want peanuts to show up in protein group because uh, they're high in protein. And so by changing that data, you see the, the items immediately fly out of scope. Uh, they're now over in the protein group. Um, so I, I pointed out that these secondary colors are mapped to calories. I actually implemented it so I can change that color to represent different quantities. So I'm going to change it to thiamine. Now it'll take a few moments for it to update the visuals here. Um, while I do that, I'm going to go and sort by preparation. Okay, now everything's up to date. Now you see some interesting things here with uh, different preparations and the amount of thiamine. For example, canned items have much lower thiamine than, say, frozen items. So it'd be interesting to delve into that relationship a little more. So to control a few of the variables, um, we can focus in on, on just some of these items. So for example, um, yellow corn. So I'll just search for yellow corn. And now this relationship is much clearer. You see raw corn is very high in thiamine. Um, other preparations have a moderate amount, but canned corn is very low in thiamine. Um, if you did a little bit of research, you'd find that thiamine is water soluble, so a lot of the nutrients are lost um, through this preparation. We also notice this interesting relationship with corn that has been frozen then boiled. Um, this corn actually maintains its thiamine very well, but only if it's left on the cob, not if it's taken off the cob. So that's a, a very complex relationship that just pops out of the data because of this visualization. Let's step back to slides for a moment. Um, again, summarize what I've shown. This is live data. You can edit the data, um, and it will update the visuals and layouts in real time. You can also, of course, propagate any changes that you make um, through an editing interface back to your data set. Uh, there's also a number of customization options, as I've shown, and a couple others that I haven't shown. Uh, a word on how this works. Um, you have a number of objects. Uh, these can be normal Silverlight objects, OData entities, uh, simple arrays read in from a CSV file. The nutrition data was actually a CSV file. Um, you create a number of properties, and those properties know how to get the data out of uh, the individual items. And then you define a set of visual templates uh, that display how the items look. Uh, there are a number of applications of Pivot Viewer. Uh, I won't go through it all. Um, since we released the first version over a year ago, uh, a number of people have used it um, in all these different domains. Uh, one last demo. So this is um, taxonomy information for vertebrates. Uh, you'll notice the colors are uh, mapped to the class that these items are in, except uh, everything we consider fish is this dark blue color. Um, one significant thing about this data set is it's much larger than what you could normally display in Pivot. Um, this type of visualization have, has limits both uh, because of performance uh, and because of the size of the items. If you get too many items, they get really small on the screen, and the benefit is limited. So uh, two approaches to larger sets is uh, through sampling, or in this case, through grouping. Uh, these items are actually grouped uh, so that what you see here represents uh, almost 51,000 different species. So let me filter quickly down to just the European. Um, now that we're zoomed in a little more, you can see there are holes in some of these data. So this is actually a mashup between taxonomy information and endangered species information. So you can see uh, this group, this cluster, uh, contains four missing species. Uh, let me uh, focus in on salmons. If you went to the dinner on Monday uh, or have eaten other salmon while you're here in Sweden, it's interesting to know that there are some salmon species that are 
that are endangered. Now what you want to do here now that you're filtered is to see these species individually instead of in a group. So uh, I've implemented that switch. So now it's going to expand each of those items, each of those items into the individual species. Another thing you'll notice now is there's two different types of visuals. Uh, in addition to being a data mashup, it's also a visual mashup. I'm using um, some visuals from an endangered species set that's been shown to the viewer before. And this can give you idea, also gives you an idea of how complex these visuals can be. There's a secondary color here, arrows that indicate um, a decreasing population level, some high resolution visuals, um, and even a deep zoom map down here. Um, that shows that these little fish actually live in lakes in Sweden. Uh, so one last thing, just to bring this full circle. Um, you'll remember uh, Heckel's uh, taxonomy of vertebrates. Now, based on this infographic, uh, you expect mammals to uh, take up nearly a half of the known species. Now, I could do a little fact-checking here with Pivot Viewer. Um, based on the publication year, I can filter it down to just species that were known in Heckel's time. And as you can see from this data, this infographic is wildly misleading. The number of fish uh, vastly outnumbers the number of mammals, and even the number of birds is double that of mammals. So using Pivot Viewer, we've exposed an inaccuracy in that graphic. Um, that concludes my talk. I just want to acknowledge um, there's a lot of uh, work that's been done uh, on Pivot Viewer, uh, both in Microsoft Live Labs and more recently by the Pivot Viewer team. And thanks to Microsoft Research for this opportunity to come here and speak today. Um, I'll just leave it, uh, leave you with a few links if you like what you saw today. Uh, version two of Pivot Viewer uh, releases uh, any day now. It's supposed to be out by the end of the year. Uh, in the Silverlight 5 SDK. Um, so check out one of these links if you like what you saw. Thank, Thank you. you. I have been in the field of materials, and I want to ask you, how do you carry out uh, total quality control of the data? And, uh, in case of element, it is very easy. But in case of real materials, uh, do you have some idea to control the quality of the data? Um, so yeah, it's not Pivot Viewer's intention to address the quality issues of the data. Um, one thing we've found with Pivot Viewer is it's actually a great way to find quality issues in the data because as you saw with, um, with the peanuts, they stood out as something different within the vegetable group. So um, it's a good way to see those uh, discrepancies and problems in your data and, and correct them. had scenarios that identifies the outliers and then enable some other kind of research. So we can take that offline and show you a couple of things. Session right after lunch, there is a lot of opportunities you can interact with us, hopefully, on these and the following couple of more uh, presentations, uh, the demos will trigger some of your thoughts. So and um, carry on. Ilya and um, Zaslavsky, yeah. did I say that right? Yes. <laughs> um, from UCSD has been collaborating with us using some animal tracking kind of data and implemented in Pivot Viewer and a couple of other uh, visualization platforms. So that's what Ilya is going to show us. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I'll talk about three uh, projects in environmental observatories uh, that I've been involved in, and we'll try to address some of the interesting points that have been raised here. Uh, we, we had a 
a series of very interesting talks over the last couple of days uh, from citizen-based uh, um, observations to uh, capability models of uh, domains and vocabularies. And so I'll try to focus on these things so that we may have this discussion going. So these, these are the three things that I will talk about, uh, um, assuming I'll have enough time for, for the last one. Because I also want to show you demos I tried to, to work with uh, Pivot, uh, uh, actually because uh, a year and a half ago I went to uh, Microsoft Faculty Summit and where, where Pivot was demonstrated was an exciting thing. So I came back home and over the weekend tried to build my first Pivot, which uh, was with um, uh, camera, tra uh, uh, camera traps. So th I'll show that later. Uh, but uh, these different projects are uh, slightly different in, in how they deal with integration. One is trying to build a common infrastructure for one domain for hydrologic data. A uh, critical zone observatory is trying to integrate data between domains. And uh, the last one is trying to develop uh, analytical workflows and workflows for computing different indexes based on multiple types of data. Uh, and also, this is where we, we use some nice visualization tools. Uh, there have been some attempts in, uh, uh, by NSF, the National Science Foundation, to recognize that there are common requirements uh, and common components in these different uh, environmental observatory projects. Uh, uh, FION has been an initiative that had a few meetings. FION stands for Federation of Environmental Observatory Networks. Finally, uh, now it's kind of matured into uh, EarthCube initiative. This is uh, um, uh, a new program that NSF is trying to promote and there will be some likely funding to uh, work on integration uh, uh, across different uh, Earth science domains. So I'll have a couple slides about uh, EarthCube later on. But now about QUASI. QUASI uh, stands for Consortium of Universities for Advancement of Hydrologic Sciences. It's a consortium of about 120 uh, universities in, in the U.S. and several affiliates in uh, other countries. And there are several projects that it, run, uh, that it runs, including Hydrologic Information System. Uh, in terms of how that uh, system works, it's typical, you know, publish, find, bind pattern. You have, we, we have some software that people can download and install and publish their hydrologic data. Uh, if they can fit this data, of course, in the information model that we provide, and I'll talk about these confusions later. Uh, then we uh, pick up this data and index in a, in a, in a catalog, and then it, it can be consumed by uh, a few clients. Uh, it has been uh, funded by NSF, and we had quite a number of uh, partners in both government and uh, academia and so on the uh, um, commercial side, including Microsoft. Uh, the main issue is that uh, the data are highly heterogeneous. Uh, you can get data from many different types of sensors. This would be uh, water quality data, discharge data. Uh, the types of information models that will come with them are different. Also, there may be some common components in them. Uh, then you can get data from um, uh, uh, satellite remote sensing. You can generate a lot of modeling data. And uh, in order to uh, run hydrologic models and other types of models, you need to integrate this data in, in some way. Uh, another issue is that these data are available from multiple sources. There are about 20 uh, federal agencies in the U.S. that uh, generate water data. They have their own observation networks. They have been all following their own standards about how they name variables, how they uh, describe what they collect. Uh, uh, besides federal agencies, of course, state agencies and uh, uh, counties, um, universities, and uh, you can add to it citizen science. science. Uh, so essentially what we have different types of observation stations produced by different groups. We want to combine them into a single picture and we also want to generate a mechanism by how other observation networks can be added to, to that picture. So if we have, uh, if we superimpose state level observation networks on top of federal county levels and individuals and then eventually citizen science, it can be a fairly large growing uh, system, but will have a single interface by which you can uh, point to a location or to a watershed a catchment and say what, uh, what data is available regardless from where it comes from for, for this area on, say, salinity or, or dissolved phosphate chain or something like that. Uh, 
the old way of getting this data was you would go to each individual website or call on the phone to somebody who has the data. And uh, if you're lucky to, uh, that the, the provider will have a website, there will be a series of forms and very different types of outputs. So we try to make it much simpler um, and uh, create a common um, uh, relational schema, common information model uh, that was expressed in the relational schema and also in uh, um, uh, uh, XML schema. Uh, and finally, uh, as a set of uh, services. So uh, kind of one of the uh, principles of the project was to uh, eat our own dog food. I think this is the expression that was, that actually came from Microsoft. <laughs> um, so basically we, we, we develop a set of interfaces and we must use these, these interfaces because we, do, we want to create a platform we, and if we want others to develop against the same platform, we, we better try it, try it ourselves. So uh, uh, this resulted in a set of requests that was fairly limited, that had very low barrier for entry uh, for uh, hydrologists. So graduate students could easily write against the, this, uh, uh, these calls and, and uh, did this type, of, uh, this type of encoding. So the encoding, as a result, uh, ended up quite popular. Uh, it was eventually adopted by uh, USGS, uh, uh, National Climate Data Center, um, Army Corps of Engineers and a bunch of other groups. So actually a lot of hydrologic data in the country is now available in, uh, in this format over these type of services. Uh, so how you publish this data, you uh, load data into SQL Server according to the schema that we, uh, uh, that I've showed in a couple of previous slides. And then you just take the services, configure them to, to connect to the database and you have a server. Uh, then the server gets indexed in the catalog and uh, you uh, uh, can find this data and access them from, from, from clients. Uh, we developed uh, a few clients. Hydro Desktop is uh, now open source .NET based uh, desktop client, but there are also web-based clients developed not only by us, but uh, by others as well. Uh, and this is what uh, HS Central Catalog now has. Uh, 76 services, uh, including these federal agencies, USGS, EPA, and others. Uh, about 18,000 variables, and that's a separate story that I'm going <laughs> to talk about. You can't really uh, effectively search uh, 18,000 variables without some tricks. Um, we have about 2 million sites of hydrologic measurements. So just to give you a flavor of uh, the scale of uh, uh, the system, it's about uh, 7,000 uh, download requests per day. It's uh, not much by standards of uh, Microsoft, Google, Yahoo, but for an academic project is quite, quite, quite large. That requires that we maintain um, monitoring services and we, we uh, have redundant systems and kind of keep it, to keep it all running. Uh, so you notice 18,000 variables. Uh, uh, it's a huge problem because uh, uh, USGS and EPA have been trying to agree on what they measure and how they call it for quite some time. Um, they uh, have a project called Substance Registry System that I will show you in a, in a, in a, few, in a few minutes where they try to match variables measured on, on both sides. But with each of them having about 15,000 variables, uh, 15,000 variable codes, it becomes a fairly long task. Uh, so we, we try to convert this. It's not really an ontology. It's, sort, uh, it's a vocabulary with some hierarchy on top that makes it easy to search, but I probably would not treat it as, uh, uh, common, uh, as a correct ontology. In any way, uh, uh, yeah, there are lots of heterogeneities in how you name uh, units and how you name uh, mediums. Th that's my favorite. That actually happened in one data set. Yeah, yeah. This loved oxygen. Uh, so we, we, we have been developing some tools that would, I, it's quite clear that we, were, we, are not, we, we cannot curate 18,000 variables and make them connect. So it should, should be a community process and community needs some fairly simple tools that uh, hydrologists can work with to arrange, the, uh, uh, to arrange the variables in some search hierarchies and to uh, um, add definitions to the variables and create some common lexicon. Uh, so we have a semantic wiki for that and some uh, ontology or concept editor where 
we can move around concepts and it becomes very visual. Uh, another thing that uh, I wanted to show, and this is something that uh, I had uh, a very ugly demo of uh, using the previous version of um, um, Pivot Viewer. And yesterday, Brian actually converted it to the new version, and it became much better. So th this is uh, about 10,000 variables that are uh, that USGS and PPA has been has looked at. Uh, these are the variables that they agree on, not agree, uh, not checked, and uh, uh, used by one uh, agency and not by the other. We can look at them by let's select some uh, characteristic names. Uh, it really gives you a very interesting visual view. And see, it's a little bit slower. There are 10,000 elements here. Uh, with the different level of detail, as you zoom in, you get more information about each item. If we split them by characteristic name, we can see immediately in, each in, in, in which group there is more agreement, less agreement, and what, what has been the pattern of uh, coordination between between the agencies. Yeah, and each of them you can so you can go to ammonia. Uh, just to give you a flavor of how many actual variables have been used to describe ammonia. That that's just that this column. And as you get closer, you see that they may they may be different in uh, the medium in which uh, variables are measured in the units and, and so on. So one uh, component of making this system a community-based is to have community tools for managing ontology. Other components are trying to come up with uh, agreed upon uh, information models and encodings so that um, well when you publish hydrologic data, when you try to access the data, you follow the same standard. And coming to an agreement is uh, always uh, uh, fairly difficult uh, process, uh, it, it really works well once you have a lot of quality data available in this format already. So our first step in the project was to uh, work with USGS and EPA and make this data available in, in the common format. Then others started to, uh, to get on the bandwagon. Uh, and to have the services in a fairly reliable, redundant, uh, monitored and logged fashion. Uh, another component is, of course, all the code is open source and shared, uh, and uh, everybody are welcome to uh, to join if you if you work on this uh, on a related thing. Uh, so the standard that we developed uh, was quite good because it was simple and worked for 80% of use cases. But uh, there are certainly more use cases, and if we if we look at uh, uh, international uh, 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 landscape, there are uh, quite a few. Uh, use cases where you need to exchange information five minutes uh, uh, across the border, and uh, then you have to face differences in language, differences in codings, differences in um, how things are done between U.S. and Canada, how things are done between France and Germany, uh, to deal with that and to, to come up with a common standard for um, international standard for hydrologic data. Uh, there is a group under OGC. OGC is Open Geospatial Consortium that is a standards body for spatial data. There is a group now called Hydrologic, Hydrology Domain Working Group that tries to come up with a common information model, vocabulary system, services, and um, feature model for, for this data. Uh, uh, the group operates by setting up interoperability experiments where uh, people come together and try to work out some kinks in, in, in the standard, and then eventually the standard gets to uh, get voted on and becomes an international, eventually an ISO. And uh, once it gets a, uh, endorsed by WMO, which is also uh, a sponsor of this group, then it becomes mandatory for, for members. Uh, a few words about another project. CZO uh, is a slightly different flavor because here we're talking about integration across domains. Uh, 
not just hydrology, but hyd hydrology plus uh, atmosphere plus biosphere plus lithosphere. In addition, we have different uh, uh, different uh, scales, uh, temporal scales and spatial scales, and uh, we have very diverse data types. How to build an information system for, for this type of observatory? Um, it's uh, technically would be a difficult problem, but uh, as you see, m most challenges are on the social side, uh, <laughs> of course. So all the constraints and uh, principles of development are defined in terms of uh, let's let uh, PIs who are on the research side do what they want to do, and we want to be we don't want to be too intrusive, but maybe we can agree on some common uh, denominator of how they would expose their data to, uh, uh, so that we can still build uh, integration layer. Uh, so these principles are, they are free to operate their system. The only thing that uh, we will ask them to do is to uh, export data in ASCII and then we'll pull it from their websites. Uh, yeah, each CCO publishes data on the web as ASCII files uh, with some agreed upon metadata, fairly minimal. Then we can um, add what, what is missing. I know. And uh, uh, that also makes it easier on the central side because we can uh, maintain a uh, central archive and services and keep s updating services as new standards come, come along. So it becomes a standard-based system at the same time with as little intrusion on the um, authorities of PIs as possible. Another issue is, and I'll, I'll just need a few minutes, uh, is that when we talk about interoperability, different people think of it in very different ways. For many people, it means uh, we would just, I, I would just need to find data from, from others. Uh, that means that we shall have a catalog and data will be registered at the catalog. Uh, that allows very diverse type of data to be registered. Mm -hmm. At the next level, you want to be able to understand what, what you find in this other catalog. So if there is some way to uh, declare that your data subscribe to a formal vocabulary, then you may eventually build vocabulary crosswalk. Uh, next level, you may want from your client to send standard services to different types of observation data and bring them, uh, bring them into your application regardless of differences in application schemas, right? So that, uh, in OGC world, that would be, you would be sending SOS requests, uh, which is sensor observation service or, or other types of requests. And finally, that, that there can be some commonality at the level of uh, information models if you follow uh, so-called observation and measurements uh, schema and profile your data to that schema. Uh, if we try to express this in uh, cross-domain fashion, this essentially means that uh, these four components, which require a uh, common catalog, some vocabulary services, some uh, uh, service interfaces, and domain models, uh, become the four main components that we expect from each domain to um, to be sort of ready for integration at this cross-domain uh, cross integration level. So uh, in this schema, and uh, you see the heading is Earth Cube. I have one more slide after that. <laughs> yeah. Um, we recognize that there are three levels, level of research sites, research labs, and they are fairly independent. We harvest this data into domain systems, which uh, establish of, uh, these four components, catalogs, vocabularies, uh, service interfaces and some formal domain models uh, in a way that allows you to integrate them. So in terms of vocabularies, if everybody asks SQOS, then we can do SQOS crosswalks. In terms of catalogs, if, every, if everybody has CS, CSW, catalog services for the web, then we can integrate and we, we can federate catalogs. If uh, uh, all uh, service interfaces are, say, SOS compatible, then we can, we, we can write applications that would go across the country. So at the higher, at, at the upper level, we deal with these vocabulary crosswalks, uh, with a synthetic curated data set, and uh, I if if these data sets are built from services that come from from each side, then it's easier to trace provenance, and this is a very critical component in establishing trust in the data, because uh, when you pull data from other domains, you don't really know what to trust. So there are, there are two ways to do that: keep provenance and keep some social network and both things so that you can actually ask people. Uh, all right, last slide. And uh, NSF EarthCube is a new initiative uh, from NSF uh, with the goal to transform uh, CI so that 
different communities talk to each other. So this is where uh, uh, hopefully environmental informatics at Microsoft can contribute. And uh, about a month ago, there was a big meeting at, uh, in, in DC with about 200 uh, people and uh, more than 100 white papers uh, written about how this integration may happen and what components uh, would, would be useful. Uh, I, I would stop here. Uh, also, I have some information about Tim, but um, this will be on the web and you, you can, uh, you may want to go in there and, uh, uh, yeah, any, any questions? That, that that was that first the, the that's the old version that's yeah that's the old version. yeah so so one way to visually explore this is camera trap camera uh, camera trap pictures uh, somewhere in Suriname and if you look at uh, different species how they respond to how they show up uh, with different at uh, different temperatures you see that distributions are quite different and then you can zoom in and see what yeah, these species are, right? And yeah, some pictures are quite amazing. You can go and look at, uh, and look at say, one health, yeah. Yeah, something like that, yeah. So <laughs> okay. Yeah, that, that was actually a very easy thing to do. Uh, it took me not that long to publish the first first pivot. It's, really it's a good system. Uh, I have a question. Uh, um, so the governmental organization who can produce uh, high quality data and citizen group ba by taking advantage of this uh, data platform? Um, uh, you actually made yeah. better answering yeah. this question. So the BP oil spill thing is one of the examples that we, we work with EPA and we grab their data and then we convert it into data service and then from there, you can either view it this way to, to analyze the chemicals out of those oil spill effect, or you can view it in um, beam maps or worldwide telescope to visualize how geographically it affects the neighborhood. So we do work with them like that, yeah. yeah the reason why I ask is in the Yeah, oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, we uh, actually EPA, for one, uh, provides really nice publicly available data sets. So when we build applications using EPA's data, um, everything is shareable, including the data. Right? So thank you. Um, thanks. We should switch gears to yet another uh, visualization presentation, but from a very different perspective. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me to, to join this wonderful workshop. And I'm going to, to talk about my experiences, just uh, that. Uh, I'm a computer scientist, uh, but I happen to, to work with a, a paleoclimatology group. But my background is uh, informatics. And uh, I have been working with this group for a decade. And I have been through different phases that I think is something that is interesting. To, to know about if we want to use uh, di data visualization. So I'm going to talk about visual analytic challenges in environmental science. And I'm going to, to resort on some popular culture to try to, to make my point clear. So let's start with this. This is uh, a representation of the four classical elements 
air, fire, earth, and water. And I'm going to use a piece of uh, fairly well-known popular culture, which is the Fantastic Four. And according to the authors, these superheroes pertain to each of these classical elements. So we have the Invisible Woman, the Human Torch, the Thing, and Mr. Fantastic. And this is the author's work, and it's not me. So for some of you, it may be shocking that the thing is the most lovable hero of the group. <laughs> but <laughs> no, many, many people <laughs> think about that. But I'm going to use just these features of the superheroes, the ability to manipulate, to fly, to be lovable, and to reshape. And this is what I'm going to use to characterize the fantastic four of data visualization. So, this is one example, is the statistician. Many, maybe some of you recognize this woman, if not, you are going to, to learn about uh, her a little bit further. Then we have this and another superhero, is the geographer. In this one, most well known is this one, is a designer, which is something that can be shocking for some people to, to learn about. And finally, someone that is well known, is a computer scientist that obviously takes part in this data visualization endeavor. So why uh, the statistician? because this is uh, Florence Nightingale. She was a nurse, and she was able to convey some story from the data, starting from a typical data table, and providing a, a new way of looking at the data. This is a diagram, it's called COSCOM. She was able to convey uh, one important thing, is it was that most of the dead people were due to the conditions of the hospital rather than the conditions of the war. So statistics is helpful. Then we have Charles Minard. He was the geographer of, the, of Napoleon. And of course, he used maps because they are the most powerful visual tools that we have, and we all use them. But Instead of having a typical uh, representation in a map, he tried with a completely different thing, which is a flow map, by using just two ideas. The width of the line conveys the number of soldiers, and the color brown is the campaign going to Moscow, and the black line is the soldiers coming back, is the retreat of the of Napoleon. Uh, soldiers. So this small uh, um, diagram is conveying a dramatic story with just a few uh, ideas. Then we have Harry Beck, who is able to go from this. This is the, at that time, this was the, the metro map. So if you wanted to go from one station to another, you have to look at this. So by changing a little bit the reality, he provided this, which is commonplace now, everywhere. So the idea is that you have to think about beautiful, neat, clean, attractive ways of portraying the information. Because visualization is something that occurs in the mind. It's not a tool. It's something that we have, and we have to, to, to have a proper mental model to twist, to uh, ask questions, and eventually to get the answers. And finally, the computer scientist that is able to introduce novel techniques and cares about interaction. And this is a commonplace, again, this is a hierarchy everywhere in, in science. But instead of having nodes and edges that uh, quite easily you end up uh, wait, wanting, wanting for more space to, to, to represent the hierarchy, we can try another approach, which is this container approach, and go further by using colors somehow related to what people view 
uh, is done, is doing. So this is the starting point. And my key idea is that, well, this is, uh, can be summarized from this uh, uh, saying. You want the data, the data to tell a story. But the thing is, if we have data scientists and environmental scientists, who is the one who makes the story and who is the one who understands the story? It's like in the uh, movie making. So, uh, in order to understand a story, you need someone who makes the, the movie, who makes the story. And you have the audience that is reconstructing the story, but both from what is seen and also what, what's in the culture or in the uh, background of the, of the viewer. So this is just an example. This is from Seven, the, the movie. And this is the moment at the end of the movie when uh, the main character is confronted to the box. And we never get to see what's inside the, boat, the box, but we understand the story completely because we have more information than that uh, that is uh, shown in the in the screen. So this is uh, my point. I think that the, in order to to be able to to advance in in e science, we want to move in the overlapping area, and everybody has to think about this way of looking at the at the data. So this is the problem. The problem is that we are we want to, to visualize, to have this data transference. But this is normally uh, not enough. It's not enough to have a representation of something. It's the interaction that nowadays is, is important because we have huge amounts of, man, of, of data. So this is uh, our group. We have been doing visualizations for many different domains that go from phylogenetics to time motion analysis of basketball games and so on. So what is important here is that we are facing another problem, a bigger problem, which is the visualization, but through data transference and by interaction. I, I mean that is the user that is asking questions to the representation, to the visualization, and eventually getting the answer. So we we'll want to think about that. Like in this sample, we have the visualization, we have a uh, highly advanced technology, but this is not adding too much to the, to the user because we have lots and lots of, of points and no way to, to go to a particular phase or to understand relationships and so on. Sometimes it's not just a way of representing uh, data, it's that the relationships uh, among the data is what's important. Like in this case, this is uh, our piece by Aaron Koblin, it's called Flight Patterns, and only by the, uh, depicting the, the takeoffs and landings, uh, you understand the shape of the country and how everything is going as the day starts and ends and so on. Another interesting point is that nowadays we have, a, we have uh, in the previous talk, uh, Brian mentioned that we have infographics all over the place. And this is another important thing. This is meant to be used by a common user that happens to go to this MSNBC uh, web page. But this is fairly uh, advanced visualization. Eh? And which is interesting to me is that this is not done by scientists or computer scientists or data scientists. This is done by pure designers. And again, this tell us something that is important, that is beauty uh, sometimes uh, means more than just that, okay? So again, we have, I recommend this documentary, Journalism in the Age of Data, and now we have in many places, many digital newspapers, we have plenty of interactive visualization for uh, data problems, for the people, for the citizens. And in, if you go to this documentary, you will say that they are talking about the same problems, the same tools, and everything. And this is in, important because, for instance, this is a rather recent example that appeared at Guardian Data Blog 
this is a, a classical uh, method of representation. This is a choropleth map. And just by using color, you uh, are able to understand something, in this case, about the US Fourier map. But if you look a little bit into the way this has been done, you have to look at this color scale. And this is something that is wrong. It's just wrong. It's just this color doesn't pertain to this color scale. So it's changing completely the story that you get from the picture. So if you do it properly, and also if you take into account the density of population of a different state, just by using a different representation, the story is completely different. So sometimes it's tricky just to use the tools and the visualization. And now I go to my experience with a group in uh, paleoceanography, paleoclimatology, chronostatigraphy, and so on. So uh, the group is interested in many different uh, problems like wine dynamics or paleo temperature and so on. And of course, they need the collaboration of many groups and institutions and teams and so on with many different techniques, data sources, data formats, and so on. And they try to solve the problem or again with many different techniques. And this is when I started to collaborate. So the first uh, project that we did together was to try to reconstruct the surface water dynamics in South China Sea during the last 130 kilo years. So we used just conventional data mining techniques with decision trees and visualization, and we were able to uh, infer the water column stratification index, and from that we were able to provide some visualization in order to reconstruct the, the dynamics. So this is the different stages. Uh, and this is, of course, a good result. But the problem and the lesson I learned is that after that, the geologists went back to the office and keep on doing the same old things, the same old uh, methods and the way they used to, to work, which is something like this. We have the vessels going through the world and drilling the ocean, taking this core, one kilometer of sediment, and then they chop the core and analyze the different forums inside. They end up with a huge data table. And then what do they do? They just try conventional methods, like using time series and try to find some peaks some maximum, minimums, and some correlation. And they finally publish in a very similar way. It's just the representation of the time series and the periods that there is something correlated. So my first approach, OK, I want to give you a tool that is able to be uh, a used during the analysis and also for the publication. So this is. The tool, we do the same. We collect all the data, and we provide the plot side by side of the different uh, variables. We estimate some statistics and maximum trends, and so on. And we finally provide the same uh, representation to be used directly to the publication. But again, this, is, this wasn't enough and we wanted to do something else. At that time, well, before that time, Didier Pallard at the L, uh, CNRS in, in France uh, was developing a, a software for uh, time analysis, time series analysis, uh, Fourier analysis, and it was uh, highly successful. And the reason of the uh, success of this tool wasn't uh, the numerical methods that were good and were useful. It's because it included an uh, interesting feature, is that it included the user into the analysis by a simple thing. And this is the, an, an example 
of the, the current version of the tool that we uh, build it uh, for a multi-platform uh, uh, setup. So the idea is that if we have, uh, in this case, we are using some method to, to provide the, the time series, but if you have different time series that you want to compare, which is interesting in the tool is that you can use the expertise of the user, the ability of uh, pattern recognition, and you are able to uh, make a lineage of the different time series. So what is interesting in this case is that it's not a numerical method, it's the user by using this rather simple visualization and interaction is changing the shape of the, of the time series and is able to provide a proper analysis. Okay, this goes uh, I am going to move because I think I'm going to use the time for something else. And the next example is, is uh, Pali analogs is related to the same area of research. And this is what we have. I said that the vessels are going, drilling the oceans, and the, they have uh, the actual measurements, the current measurements of the environmental features. So we have a database of the actual locations with the temperature, salinity, and so on. And then we have the core, this one kilometer core, so each centimeter corresponds to a particular age, uh, maybe 100 years ago, maybe 1,000 uh, years ago. It depends on the sedimentation rate, and this is the age model. But we work under uh, one assumption, is that under the same environmental condition, the distribution of the species should be similar. So if we use that idea numerically, by a uh, technique that is called uh, modern analog techniques, we can find the similarity of distribution of the species for each of the samples in the depth of the core, and we are able to reconstruct the environmental features thousands and millions of years ago. So this is interesting, and this is uh, also a problem, because this is numerical, and this is always going to work. And uh, so what I uh, experienced at that time is that if we provide the tool that we did, we end up with this. This is the black box method. I mean, all my colleagues uh, at the group just click the button and collect the results. It's just number that everything is working, but there is something missing is the expertise of the user. So. I wanted to, to provide a means of uh, get advantage of this experience of the users. So it's not just a numerical method, it's a way of being able to, to convey how each of the particular species is contributing to the reconstruction of the temperature, salinity, or whatever. So we use maps and we use um, color coding, and in this case, we use one axis for one of the uh, for each of the species, so we are able to see the distribution. And if you want to reconstruct this uh, place, we have this line, and the user, by the human ability of, of, of pattern recognition, is able to try to find the better shape of the distribution of the different species. So. This is what we did, and this is the example. So we start with two files, one for the core and one for the database, and then we can just uh, compute the dissimilarity, and then we can plot using a classical method like uh, uh, scatter plots and so on. Of course, we can, uh, yeah, we can uh, just use uh, time and see how everything evolves 
And what is interesting in this case is that we can go further just by uh, using a different way of visualization. So this is uh, a still a classical method. And in a moment, you're going to see the difference. So in this case, this is the yellow spot is the code that we want to reconstruct. And the yellow spot, or sorry, the blue spots are the most similar ones, and the red ones are the less similar ones. So we have the reconstruction. This is numerical. And then we provide some methods to tune the reconstruction according to some geological experience. So if you have those points that have been used to for the reconstruction, you can just get rid of them and recalculate and everything. Just one second and I'm going to to show the parallel coordinates plots in action and I move forward. So we can do the same and this is exactly the same idea but this is visual. Now you have everything is revealed. So you are able to follow how these particular species are contributing to the reconstruction. This can be at the very first uh, glance quite complicated but once you are uh, used to it you see that it's highly interactive and that just by uh, fixing some handles, you change the shapes and, and the reconstruction uh, and, and all. Okay, there are many other things, but I am going to, to finish the talk just with the last uh, thought. And this is uh, just 30 seconds for other two. The idea is where do we go? Well. I'm going to use the map. We are in London. We are at Victoria Railway Station, and we are going to take a short trip, just 20 minutes by car. And we are going to a place which is called Hern Hill. I don't know if you are familiar with this place. This is the place. But the interesting thing is not where do we go, is when do we go. So we are going to September. 1932, and we see this. There are some people using this kind of bicycles. They are called penny farthings, and they are having fun, and that's obvious. But, of course, there existed some dangers. This is the problem. And because of this, <coughs> these other bikes appear. These were called safety bikes because of this problem. But it was what is interesting in this case is that at the first moment, the bikers, the safety bikers, wanted to enter the race of the penny farthing. And the uh, uh, behavior of the, of the contestant were, was just laugh. Okay, but we know the, the result. We know this is what happened. And we see that when for the first time the tire was used at the racing track, its entry was hailed with derisive laughter. It was, however, quickly silenced by the high speed achieved, and there was only a tossing left when it outpaces all rivals. Okay, this is from a paper, a very uh, good paper on social construction of fats and artifacts. And my point is that we want to use this bike. We want to use the data visualization tool. So I finish with my conclusion and I think that the challenge is that we need to provide a aesthetic, novel, effective, informative tool like is the case of uh, Pivot Giver. And which is also important, we need to put back, to bring back the human expert into the analysis loop. And of course we want to enable discovery, support presentation, but what's more important I think that our role is to foster this new culture of appreciation of the data visualization. And we want to take 
into account all these challenges that I, I have been mentioning. And I finish just with H.G. Wells with this uh, quote. Every time I see an adult on a bicycle, I no longer despair for the future of the human race. So I wish you a good ride. Thank you. Both, both. I, I mean, uh, sometimes it's just a, a matter of uh, human cognition in general, but sometimes it's also that you need to, to, to tailor the, the tools for the problems because there are some uh, information that is not in the picture, something that the only the expert has and has the ability to, to connect to the problem, and you have to give the, the way to use this experience in the tool. So if you only use uh, numerical method or only some uh, fixed uh, visualization, you end up with a compli complicated situation. Like sometimes the user do not use the tool because they do not understand what's inside and then they do not trust the tool. So it's better if you are able to uh, get to the surface some information. Whether or not the CS people should provide a black box tool, it's always debatable. And wouldn't they debate even getting into the respect issue? Well, am I just here providing tools to you, or am I just your IT person? Or? So yeah, that's something we can carry over in the, the lunch, I guess we can uh, go over there. So that concludes our first half of our open data for open science session. In the afternoon after the lunch, we're going to start again with uh, all data uh, presentation and followed by a couple of really in interesting uh, scenarios um, in different environmental cases. So thank you all very much for thank coming. You.